just uh, keep that in mind. If you do have any questions, you can post them in the chat box as we are getting started. And we will take some time after everybody completes their presentation to have a, a discussion uh, about any questions that are raised during this session. Okay, welcome everyone to this free webinar. Uh, this free webinar is going to be dedicated to uh, our uh, Omics Logic Research Program that is focused on infectious diseases. And we will have several people present um, as they uh, speak about the application of genomics to uh, structures of proteins and uh, how that can be a way to investigate drug resistance, vaccine design, and protein-protein interactions based on structural computational biology. So thank you for joining us today again. Uh, Bibsa, who is normally taking these uh, sessions and uh, doing the presentation slides, is not going to be available to share the screen. So I'm going to do it instead of her. So if things don't go as smoothly as you would expect, uh, that is why. OK, so uh, let me briefly introduce you first to our omics logic programs. Uh, this uh, presentation or the free webinar is a part of the collaboration with a group of uh, researchers out of Noguchi Memorial Institute for Medical Research at University of Ghana. Uh, there they are interested in uh, analysis of genomic, transcriptomic, and structural data related to infectious diseases, specifically in malaria and SARS-CoV-2. And so as a part of what we do here at Pine Biotech, uh, we run these omics logic training programs, and a lot of them are focused on these types of research questions. But to give you a broader perspective, uh, we have been doing uh, omics logic for about a couple of years now, and we've been successfully able to run programs at several different institutions, including uh, Louisiana State University, Georgetown University, Amity University in India, and uh, many others. And as a result, we've developed collaborations around the world with researchers that are interested in the application of bioinformatics to a variety of different challenges related to biomedical research, as well as practical clinical applications of those research findings and other areas like biotechnology and agrobiology. So our major collaborator in this effort is the Tauber Bioinformatics Research Center, which is a research center that is focused on development of novel algorithms to address very various research challenges, including the integration of multi-omics data. Now, omics logic was built as a bioinformatics training program that leverages some of these tools and uh, research projects to uh, train people around the world to have uh, better skills and access to big data processing capabilities on top of this research platform uh, called the T-Bioinfo platform. So the Omics Logic Training Program has now over 10,000 users, 30 uh, universities, and five local chapters, as you can see around the globe. So we're very excited about growing this program. And so we are inviting most of you uh, that are joining us for the first time to explore some of these research pro uh, programs um, that you can learn more about on the um, uh, website learn.omicslogic.com. So if you could please post that link in the chat box. So as I mentioned, this program is a part of this uh, training program on bioinformatics for infectious diseases where we explore relevant tools, methods, and data repositories on a uh, variety of different uh, pathogens, including SARS-CoV-2, tuberculosis, Ebola, and malaria. We learn from curated case studies and peer-reviewed publications and test the understanding by analyzing sample data, mastering key elements of analysis and visualization tools to be able to design and develop an independent research project. So what are some of the things that we just finished covering in this program that is coming to an end? Uh, we talked about the applications of genomic, transcriptomic, and structural biology data, and then we focused more on genomics. So how can we actually use variant uh, detection and uh, var variability to start thinking about protein-protein interaction, 
um, as well as uh, uh, drug repurposing and uh, docking. And so uh, what we will do today is we will focus on, first of all, how genomic data can help us understand infectious disease progression and spread. Then we will talk about how this type of genomic information is useful for uh, protein uh, analysis. And then we will actually discuss how um, this uh, could be further expanded upon using tools from computational biology based on structural analysis in application to drug resistance and drug repurposing in uh, uh, malaria uh, infection. So I want to briefly uh, mention that the program is also coordinated together with principal investigators, Dr. Anita Gansa, who is a senior research fellow and lecturer at uh, the Noguchi Memorial Institute for Medical Research at University of Ghana, and Dr. Bright Adu, who is also a senior research fellow and lecturer there. And uh, to speak a little bit more about how genomic data is uh, useful for uh, understanding drug resistance, vaccine design, and protein-protein interaction, I want to pass this on to Dr. Harpreet Kaur. Uh, Dr. Harpreet Kaur um, is a, a researcher at Pine Biotech, but um, she earned her PhD in bioinformatics. Uh, and uh, her focus was on cancer genomics but now she's expanding that to also uh, teach and talk about the applications of genomics and transcriptomics and in infectious diseases. And she is the project mentor for Omics Logic Research Projects. So Harpreet, um, I will pass this on to you. Thank you, Ilya, for introduction. So let me share my screen. So hello everyone, my name is Harpreet Kaur. I have a PhD in bioinformatics. In my current role, I'm Omics Logic uh, project mentor and trainer with the Pine Biotech. I'm assisting participants to learn about data analysis, machine learning and visualiz visualization in application to the large data set used in the biomedical research. Today, I'm going to provide you a glimpse how uh, should be the approach and where genomic studies can be applied using bioinformatics to facilitate in determining the key mutation or, and variants that can impact the structure and functional aspect of a protein. So in the year 2017, Feng uh, Lu et al. published a research article in the journal Parasite and the Bacter entitled Returns of Chloroquine, Chloroquinone Sensitivity to Africa. Surveillance of African Plasmodium uh, falciparum chloroquine resistance through malaria imported to the China. So the chloroquine is a, a drug that was considered as corn, uh, cornerstone of the anti-malaria treatment in Africa for almost 50 years. Drug resistance reports compel its widely withdrawal. Uh, in this study, authors monitor chloroquinone sensitivity and determining the prevalence of genetic polymorphism and chloroquine resistant transporter gene, that is CRT, uh, particularly this uh, parasite, that is Plasmodium falciparum, isolate recently imported from the Africa uh, to the China. So based on the study, the authors suggested that a reduction in the drug pressure following the withdrawal of the chloroquine and as a, a first line drug may lead to a resurgence in chloroquine resistant uh, sensitive parasite. And uh, eventually they conclude the prevalence of bile type of uh, PF, PFCRT chloroquine sen uh, sensitive parasites from the East, South and North Africa was higher than from the West and Central area, but uh, this varied greatly between different countries. So now question arises, how we, we can study key players that are responsible for drug resistance. What are, and how we can determine what are important mutation in a specific protein or gene that result in drug resist, resistance. So once you have like your NGS sequencing data and the metadata regarding 
which sample are drug resistant or which one are susceptible one can perform mutability data analysis based on the per nucleotide mutations which calculate the mutation frequency so here we have a uh, simple pipeline by which you can perform mutability analysis so the mutability consider both mutation frequency with the coverage on our t1 for server one can easily perform mutability analysis using simple click on options next based on the mutability result one can perform principal component analysis to visualize the patterns of the samples based on the mutability result and we can find out which groups can show clear distinction among themselves we can also find out what are different outliers like here this sample based on the pca we can find out what are important outlier like shown in this orange color so one can filter out those outliers based on the pca so once we got clear distinction uh, group based on the these pca results like here we can see this green group and this so it could be uh, we can uh, these groups can be from different regions or a different country so for instance you want to find out what are significant differential mutation between the different population from these two different regions so one can perform differential meet mutation analysis again using the different pipeline uh, on a t1 which is integrated on a t1 for server so here one can find out what are important mutations like here you have a reference position then based on which whether a nucleotide is muted to any alternative allele or if there is any mute, uh, deletion or a insertion one can analyze those results so another way to find out the key mutation between different sample is multiple sequence alignment and we can also perform phylogenetic an analysis on the t1 for server we can perform multiple sequence alignment uh, based on cluster w algorithm using this t1 for server uh, and here we can perform multiple sequence alignment with both if you have fasta data in the fasta format and the fastq format so from the msa uh, analysis we will get important information like here we have this table uh that can be used to identify important variants or the key mutations between different samples so for example here let me show you uh, here here uh, based on the msa we can find out what are important mutations that are taking place at nucleotide level among a different samples or among different population so then we can uh, also find out what are important mutation which are actually translated at amino acid level so subsequently we can find out what are important variants among these samples so this is we can do with both in r and the uh, on using the server that are available on, on our two different platforms so then it is important to understand whether mutations those mutation that you have identified are biologically significant or not so many nucleotide substitution have number of effect on the phenotype even if the change occur in a gene that encodes a protein because most amino acids are specified by more than one codon so the substitution that does not change the encoded amino acid is known as synonymous substitution or synonymous mutation while non in case of the non synonymous mutations when a change at a codon level also result at amino uh, results in change in amino acid those are called non synonymous mutation so to understand the biological impact we should proceed what are non synonymous mutations so once we have already identified non synonymous mutations next question arises where these uh, mutations are located on a protein like whether they are located on any functional domain or not so eventually if they are uh, you uh, if they are located in a specific position on some functional domain then we can see and analyze how these mutation eventually impact the protein structure and functionality so to talk about uh, talk about more in this aspect 
I would like to pass this session to Mr. Nigel. So over to you, Nigel. So Nigel is there. Uh, Nigel, can you hear us? Right, I can hear you now. Okay. I was struggling okay. to come on. Yeah. Thank you very much, Utapi. Okay. Okay. So let me share my screen. Right. Over to you, Nigel. Thank you. Um, Rita, um, I'm sorry, I, I can't. I can't seem to share my screen. Could you please share for me? I I don't know what's happening actually. Okay. Uh, so Nigel, we can see your screen, I believe. Okay. Just not the presentation. Um, well, this, this is not my screen. I think this is a screen. Oh, OK. Yes, please. Maybe you can reshare your screen. Yeah, so I don't know if she's going to be sharing anything, but maybe we should try again, Nigel. Right. Okay. okay. Hello. Yeah, I think I think we just need to find another way, Nigel. So if you can try either sharing your screen or we can uh, maybe move on to Mohit and then we can try again if you want to try it. All right. I think I think we can move on to Mohit because it's, I honestly don't know why I can't share my screen. Okay. Let me share my screen then. Uh, sorry, everyone, about this. Just a moment and we'll be back. Okay, so can you guys see my screen? Yes, we can. Wonderful. So, hello, everyone. Thank you for joining today. And um, as we are speaking about the session and already being introduced by Ilya, so I would not take much time about the session itself, but to tell more, more about what we are going to do. So um, we are going to talk about computational biology first. So computational biology has made powerful advances. So amongst these trends in human health has been uncovered through heterogeneous big data integration and disease associated genes were identified and classified. So uh, to everyone who's joining for the first time, my name is uh, Mohit Mazumdar. I've completed my PhD in computational biology and have been working with academia and industry to solve important research uh, problems. 
So in my current role, I'm working with students who have interest in doing research in bioinformatics. And they are from high school, they're from undergraduations, uh, colleges, undergraduates, and they are also for researchers and PhD scholars who are working on bio their own bioinformatics projects are, and are interested in completing their projects. So uh, in today's session, uh, talking about structural computational biology and the combination of uh, structural and functional study, I think the combination of uh, both structural and functional studies is one of the most rewarding, um, one of the most rewarding route to the understanding of this basic molecular uh, basis of biological function. So to consider uh, the structural aspect and then correlating it to the function and then coming to the understanding. So the computational, bi so computational biology is essentially uh, what it does is it integrates these variety of tools and heterogeneous data into a, this comprehensive spatial and temporal uh, description of biological process. So it's very fascinating. So in today's talk, uh, we will learn about tools and approaches that are used by data scientists and bioinformaticians and in collaboration with experimental biologists to address some of the challenges uh, that we see in drug resistance, especially drug resistance in malaria. So as I was telling you that our talk today would be focused on a couple of uh, major topics. And those major topics is that how we can uh, use the data that is available out there and make the most out of it and understand uh, and connect the dots. So, uh, so it has been like almost, I guess, 20 years since the first reference genome assemblies were published for uh, this, uh, for Plasmodium falciparum. So this deadliest malaria parasite and this uh, Anopheles gambi, the most important mosquito vector of malaria, especially in Sub-Saharan Africa. So now, I mean, there are so many reference genomes that, are, that now exist for all human parasites. And there are nearly uh, 40 important vectors that are around the world. So as a foundation for this genetic, uh, genetic diversity uh, and to understand that genetic diversity, there, are, have been, there have been so many studies. So I recently just looked into uh, the paper that came out uh, in malaria and uh, I saw that they represent now data from different regions. And that's so amazing. So these reference genomes uh, have helped advance our understanding of basic uh, disease biology to now drug and insecticides resistance and different types of resistance that we are seeing. And that is going to help us in taking the right kind of decisions in vaccine development efforts. So that's what we are trying to come up at. So our team recently published this blog post that talks about system biology and uh, multi-omics approach and pinpoints to some of the publicly um, available uh, resources. So maybe, I can share or maybe anyone else can share this link. So you'll find it in the chat. And if it is not, then I'll share it later. So talking about this entire process of uh, thinking in the context of solving a problem by using multiple and heterogeneous data sets, and then, um, then uh, trying to figure out strategies that could help us you know, uh, come up with a solution uh, to these, these major problems. So a system biology approach. So understanding the system biology approach uh, approaches uh, for promoting and developing of these new therapeutic drugs is now attaining a lot of importance, uh, especially nowadays. So the study of interaction uh, between the components uh, of biological system and how these interactions give rise to function and behavior of that system is something that you can say is system biology. So uh, today, we are going to practice some of it and learn a lot about it. So one of the uh, very important question, and, and today we are going to talk about in the context of uh, malaria research and the drug resistance problem, especially. So that is the case study that we are taking along with this session. So this uh, very important question of developing uh, vaccines and drugs, right? And then integrating a system biology approach and learning what other researchers have tried and then connecting the data and filling up the blanks. 
So today we are going to take you through a small case study that we have prepared as a part of, of, of uh, our ongoing projects on malaria and COVID-19. As Ilya told you, in collaboration with Dr. Anita and Dr. Bright from NMIMR. So, how do we start? Uh, so, to simply uh, say this and simply put this, what we have to do is that uh, we have to use the knowledge about the parasite, uh, the insect vector, the human host, um, and then um, all of this is again rapidly expanding this knowledge about all of them. And the challenge is now to translate this knowledge into tools that could be used to expand, uh, that could be used to impact the disease and its transmission. So based on all this information, uh, we have to come up with strategies and um, that could be used as a tool for finding the solutions. So. Uh, the problem at the same time is uh, that the exploration of these fundamental systems are generating new and interesting basic biological questions every day. So we are getting this data being generated and it's being uh, published and being deposited. Uh, so the human host and the insect vector, the parasites, they are also interacting in a complex uh, system ecology. So that interaction you have to take into consideration as well, right? So we, we can see this evolution of both parasites and the mosquito vector occurring in real time. So this emergence of drug and insecticide resistance are the prime examples of that, right? So how they are evolving. So they are evolving. So we have to evolve our strategies to be able to counter that problem. And for that, luckily, we have now so much of information out there, which we have to connect. And then we have to think that what can be done. So that's what the session is going to all about is all about and also the entire program and the projects that we are doing. So uh, in the context of uh, structural biology, so structural biology, if I tell you a little bit in the depth, so structure, structural biology is an approach which is based on free energy landscape uh, that we are looking at. Then we are looking at population shifts or the redistribution of conformational substrate in an ensemble. So maybe these uh, keywords might sound heavy for you, but uh, visualizing them and thinking in the context of like multiple structures is something uh, that you're analyzing a population. And then in a real time, when, uh, when, uh, when a structure is in motion, when you are in motion, when the proteins are moving inside your body. So that's where uh, physics come in, comes in. And then, when, then we are talking about conformational substrate in the ensemble. So, so it includes linking and thinking about the basic physiochemical principles that drives the physiological functions and dysfunctions in a disease. So we have to consider the basics. We have to consider uh, the understanding of what already have been um, achieved. So finding those drug target correlation, drug drug correlation, and all those correlation plays important role even for drug repurposing. So in, in the context of structural biology, this conformational view uh, form uh, the basis of many computational structural biology projects, and that leads to distinctiveness and also uh, innovative advances. So that's my uh, take from this approach. And now uh, I would want to talk a little bit about how to go about this. So I have been working with several of these projects uh, throughout my uh, career throughout my PhD time and throughout uh, also now. So I've gained some experience working in this area and you know seeing how problems come up and how uh, to find maybe probable, uh, probable strategies that can solve those uh, issues at hand. So uh, one of the basic uh, fundas in here is uh, to find the right resources and much of our time goes into that. And that is uh, pretty important. So how do we can, how can we save time and how can we reach to a conclusion? So starting a research project is, uh, I mean, it's still easy, but completing a research project is kind of challenging. But at the same time, completing a research project is also uh, rewarding, right? And there's a sense of achievement that we get out of it. So finding the right resources uh, from the data itself. So in structural biology, uh, what in the context of structural biology, when we are discussing finding data, we think about um, structural data. 
So we think about protein data bank. So many of you might have heard about protein data bank. Many of you have not. So maybe if you have not, you can put that in the chat and maybe we will go into protein data bank and explore how this uh, big repository of structures look like. So please put it there. So if you want me to go to protein data bank, please put one. If, if you don't want me to go and if, if you know about it, then you can put two or nothing. So uh, next is uh, the secondary analysis. So once you have the structure, then you analyze the structure, then you understand and, the, and then you annotate the structure. So we kind of talk a lot about uh, sequence annotation and there are several tools available for sequence annotation. And uh, as the structures, structural data is growing, uh, I think a lot of importance is now given to these amino acid residues that play that uh, is playing a the, that is playing a critical role, and that we got to understand from genomics. So uh, from genomics, we got that special residues, those residues that are important uh, in the context of the study, and then we have to find them out and understand what they mean, and uh, if they if they can tell us more about that, what is going on. And then uh, the tertiary analysis, and this is like a circle, we have to learn and move on and then understand and then incorporate. So it's, it's like we have to uh, improve, keep on improving. So those, uh, those information are uh, finding out in from the databases and then use tools and uh, understand, put them into a report. So reviewing is a critical component of this research process. So reviewing and being not biased about your analysis or about the thought and start not start with a, you know, a goal already, like the challenge, sometimes what happens, especially in structural biology, or especially in research is that we have a predetermined goal. So that's what I'm coming at that uh, those biases should not be there and we should uh, see that data openly. So, uh, that was about problem or question, which is pretty pretty important. And then uh, the solution or the answer. The solution, so the solution or the answer lies in these different steps that we go through from uh, from one from another in this entire process of the research. So uh, the hypothesis uh, again, the hypothesis uh, building the hypothesis is correlated to all of our research that is going on in re related to the structural biology aspect of looking uh, into the data. So when we are developing hypotheses by looking at the mutations, we are looking at a different type of uh, interactions that are going on. And based on those interactions, we are trying to you know, uh, understand that how uh, the structural changes have uh, affected the function of the protein. So finding that structure and function correlation and then hypothesizing that, okay, this might be the case. And then after you do the hypothesis, then you have to do the hypothesis testing. And that's where I think molecular dynamic simulations and docking and those tools are helpful because that helps us understand or validate some of those hypotheses that we have generated. And also going back to the experimental uh, phase and doing those experiments to, uh, to pin that to the, uh, to the places that you have pinpoint. So before that, when you're not using big data, when you're not doing uh, in-depth analysis, you're coming to a conclusion based on single, uh, single gene analysis. Now what you're doing is that you're considering all of the components and then developing an hypothesis and then testing that hypothesis. So that kind, kind of validates uh, a lot of this uh, into defining and you're putting your hypothesis out there and also to validate that. So in the context of today's problem, uh, uh, the anti-malarial uh, anti drug resistance, we will be talking in the context of how we can annotate a problem that, uh, that we have, uh, maybe Nigel would have, if, if Nigel would have started, then you would have known about the problem, but here I will, let me define the problem. So um, the anti-malarial anti drug resistance in plasmodium falciparum, so as, as you know, there's a uh, link that is out, uh, put here that you can uh, all go to and look in the, into the resources that are available, are available at this uh, website, Malaria Gen. So um, from looking into the sequences and understanding, so here you are seeing a sequence alignment of uh, another protein and a structure of another protein, but to correlate about the understanding of how these sequences affect the uh, 
residues and affect the um, affect the behavior of the protein make it drug resistance is something really fascinating so how this is happening how these uh, uh, organisms are evolving against the drugs and how we can counter them is something that we are going to do next so in that context we would want to first understand what are the mutations that are annotated that are that we have looked into so in this case study we started uh, looking into that so we kind of started looking into some of the data sets uh, that are available some of the literature that is uh, available so here uh, you will see uh, so here you will see about uh, the different drug resistance uh, uh, mechanisms that are there and also the um, proteins that are involved in different sort of uh, uh, resistance so as you see that that this is not a problem that could be defined from a single protein perspective so there are multiple proteins and pathways that are involved to understand the drug resistance problem problem in malaria so here our focus is uh, crt so chloroquine uh, resistance uh, transporter uh, so today we are going to talk about it but before we talk about that let's try to understand a little bit about the mechanism of resistance so the mechanism of resistance can happen through i mean maybe few uh, ways so one way is that the mutation in the target gene that is what we are looking at so we are looking at uh, finding those mutations that enable that uh, gene to skip or to find a way uh, and uh, get resistance so that is one another is increase production of target and then decrease uh, uh, drug accumulation so that is in the context of efflux and then drug activation so uh, in the context of uh, drug resistance uh, when we are talking about uh, the increase production of target uh, so this another mechanism which is involved in drug resistance that involves uh, expressing uh, express, expressing higher levels of target so this can be accomplished either through uh, increased transcription and translation of gene amplification so this results in a in a requirement of higher level of drugs to achieve the same level of inhibition right so this is one method another is decreasing drug drug accumulation or metabolizing metabolizing the drug to a non toxic products that will result in less drug re reaching the target and also contribute to drug resistance so that's another uh, mechanism the another uh, mechanism that we discussed uh, that we want to discuss is that drug resistance can also involve the accumulation of mutations that is in the same or different targets which will have a addictive or synergistic effects so you can see it's quite complicated so parasites with mutations or genetic polymorphisms which confer a uh, uh, which confer a decrease in drug sensitivity can be selected uh, under this drug can be talked about in under this drug pressure so that is about the drug uh, different type of drug resistance mechanism but here in today's session our focus is to learn about the drug uh, resistance that have developed through these major mutations and these mutations have been uh, mm, these mutations have been uh, characterized by scientists by uh, uh, involving doing these several experiments and uh, different groups and then they get characterized and then they get listed so i do have a small video to show uh, to show all of you about this chloroquine quinine uh, drug resistance uh, so maybe i'll try to play and uh, you can tell me if you can uh, listen to it or not if it is audible or not Queen. Yes, it is audible. Okay, thank you. Malaria is a disease which results from infection with Plasmodium parasites. This parasite is dependent on the host's hemoglobin to obtain its basic nutritional needs. Globin chains provide the essential amino acids, but 
heme residues are toxic to the parasite. This parasite protects itself from heme toxicity by polymerizing heme molecules into hemozoin. Antimalarial drugs like chloroquine bind heme molecules and prevent their polymerization into hemozoin. As a result of this inhibition, heme will accumulate within the parasite and the toxic effect will increase, eventually killing the parasite itself. Thank you. So this was about the mechanism and how this uh, chloroquine works. So it's kind of important to understand uh, this before going into the experiment and designing experiments. So that's why we showed you this video and further like structural annotation. So as I was telling you more about that, uh, that it's important before going into the docking or uh, simulations, we have to figure out that what is going on uh, with the protein and why there are so many uh, drug resistance uh, problem that we are seeing. So there are studies that uh, reflects exactly that, that how this has happened and what is the reason. So PFCRT is, uh, is the molecule that we are studying. So, so uh, in the context of PFCRT, uh, there are post-translational modifications that can happen. So those can be uh, phosphorylation, phosphorylation, ubiquitination, and all of that. So however, the impact of these uh, post-translational modification on plasmodium falciparum's uh, biology, and in particular, the drug resistance. So that, that is something that has been kind of addressed in this, uh, uh, in, a, in using some techniques in this paper that came up uh, quite recently in 20, 2019. So here they are confirming that, <coughs> Sorry. So here they're confirming that at uh, serine 33, there is phosphorylation and also at 411 position of this PFCRT gene. So this chloroquine resistance uh, strain um, uh, of plasmodium falciparum. So they showed uh, kinase inhibitors uh, that can sen uh, sensitize this drug responsiveness. So they use CRISPR-Cas9 genome editing uh, technology to generate a genetically engineered PFCRT variants in the parasite. And then they showed that this uh, residue, that uh, serine 33. Yes, we we'll stop seeing your slide, sorry. Oh, okay. Sorry about that. Okay, so here I was. So as I was telling you this publication, uh, about PFCRT that, talk, that talks about the post-translational modifications and then looked into the residues such as serine 33 at 33 position, so which was not characterized uh, before. And then they, they did uh, uh, CRISPR-Cas9 genome editing to generate those variants. And then they showed that uh, this, uh, to, when they change it to alanine, uh, this mutation, then they found out that the chloroquinine and quinine uh, resistance was reduced to 50%. So uh, as I was telling you that before going into the structural analysis, if we can consider these mutations, positions and look into the literature, that actually helps us a lot. So in that context, uh, we kind of started looking into the different literature that is available with these mutations. So this is open data set of Plasmodium falciparum uh, genome variation uh, that, use, that uses like 7,000 worldwide samples. And in this study, uh, what they have put up is that they have released uh, data that uh, classifies these samples into different types of drug, re drug resistance based on uh, these published uh, genetic markers that includes SNPs, uh, single nucleotide polymorphisms, and uh, SNVs, uh, copy number variations. So the methods of uh, this uh, classification is kind of quite heuristic. And uh, the, uh, one of the findings in there is that you can uh, look into the uh, different types of uh, drug resistance happened in different proteins and what are the residues that are critically affected by that. So here you can see a list of uh, 
drugs that are being used in uh, combination as, as well as uh, by single uh, single uh, delivery. So learning about the PFCRT mechanism. So before we go and learn more about uh, through structural analysis, uh, what we can learn through the uh, literature, uh, from the literature review. So uh, uh, the spread of this CQR, so we can say uh, chloroquine uh, resistance as um, I'm seeing it uh, saying it, it as CQR, which is uh, quite widely used. So the spread of CQR has led to successive uh, this anti-malarial anti drug replacements, right? Uh, and then since 2020, uh, sorry, since 2000, uh, they ha uh, people have adopted to this uh, progressive way of artemisin based combinatorial uh, combinations therapy. So AT AC ACTs, right? So this mutation in this plasmodium falciparum uh, uh, gene, so chloroqu chloroquine uh, resistance transporter gene, it confers to resistance to several antimalarial drugs. So that is uh, uh, kind of quite sure. So that is chloroquine or pipe, uh, piperaquinine. So piperaquinine is another partner molecule that is uh, being administered with arthromycin based uh, combination therapies. Ar arthromycinin. I guess, sorry, artemisinin based combination therapies. So uh, this entire, uh, this, uh, this uh, transporter, so it's very important to learn about the transporter type. So it's a membrane protein. Uh, so as a member of this drug metabolite transporter, so it's a drug metabolite transporter super family. So this uh, vacular uh, transporter PFCRT that may translocate substrate molecules right across the membrane for the digestive vacuoles like uh, li lysosome like organelle so uh, this uh, physiological substrate uh, that goes uh, that binds and like that trans that gets transport and the mechanism and the mechanism and the Something that look at. Yeah, so as I was telling you that understand uh, what we are trying to look at here in structure wise is that uh, that we are first of all looking at this uh, uh, transporter and we are trying to find out what we are trying to understand is that how this uh, how it how it works. So what is the transport mechanism and what are the functional regions that, uh, that we cannot be, that we can characterize and look into. So this uh, uh, anti-malarial anti -malarial drugs such as uh, chloroquinine or piperaquinine or uh, amidoquinine, or there are others as well, are thought to be primarily interfere with the conversion. Like you saw in the video, the, the conversion of toxic heme to a non-toxic hemozoyl crystal. So this process has been specially characterized for uh, chloroquinine, which is uh, like found in uh, high concentration and leading to accumulation of this toxic epihemi and then the death of parasite. So that's the mechanism that it used to uh, follow without resistance. So next uh, is to learn about the structure of PFCRT. So the main uh, genetic determinant of this uh, CQR in the plasmodium falciparum uh, this uh, gene that it encodes uh, 424 amino acid protein, uh, 424 amino acid residues uh, in the protein structure. And it contains uh, here 1, 2, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. So 10 transme transmembrane helices, which are uh, essential for this parasite uh, intraerythrocytic development. So at least uh, the, the six independent origins of these uh, mutations have been already reported. So there are different uh, mutations that have been reported in this gene and are quite prominent. Uh, so this various mutations in PFC uh, CRT haplotypes. So we kind of discussed in genomics that uh, studying the haplotypes and different sets of uh, non synonymous mutations such as uh, the uh, mutations that we see in asian populations and then that asian that like uh, that that latest 
uh, spread to the Af African population where there's a high level of transmission. So the mutant PFCRT molecules have acquired the ability to expel uh, the CQ out of the uh, DV. So all the CQR haplotypes carry the key K2, uh, K76 to T mutation. So here in this cavity, you see a red uh, zone out there. So that's the mutation uh, that removes a positive charge in the transmembrane uh, helix. And then uh, this uh, suggests, because this is a change in the charge, this mutation, that suggests a charge dependent transport mechanism in this uh, chloroquine, uh, which is diprotonated in the acidic uh, environment. So this k 76 t mutation is always accompanied by additional mutations. So those additional mutations may increase the CQR level or the fitness of fitness cost of resistance. So these are some of the key uh, uh, takeaway from the structure that uh, structural analysis that uh, a, a group did. So I'm going to present their work now uh, about the structure, structural analysis that they could come up with and the model they could propose. So another important aspect of uh, molecular dynamics, uh, 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 molecular, molecular uh, docking and molecular dynamic simulations is the part where we do the molecular modeling. So it's very, very important. And the reason it's important is because uh, the system that you're building, so the system has to be accurate enough to mimic what you are trying to, you know, uh, see inside, right? So what we are trying to do is run simulations. Uh, we are trying to run, uh, uh, trying to uh, simulate a binding, uh, binding process, right? When you're trying to do docking, you're trying to simulate a binding process. And then uh, when we are trying to do it through simula uh, from molecular dynamic simulations, then we are looking at, what we are looking at is that how that, uh, uh, binding effects or how the protein functions mechanistically and with a mutation. So it's moving and when it is moving, it is functional. And then when it is functional, it should behave in a certain way. So those are the patterns that we want to see in the data. So um, coming back to the PFCRT structure, uh, just a second. So maybe I'll take a break and look at the questions if there are any questions so far. Okay. Um, yeah. I think uh, Mohit, you can continue. I have now the slides for Rita and Nigel. So after you finish, I will show their slides and hopefully uh, Nigel can speak over that. So the next part would be, Ilya, I would want to do some uh, structural uh, classification and then structural analysis. So I think maybe it would be best if uh, Nigel can talk about the problem now and then we can show the uh, practical outcome. Okay. Sure. Okay. Okay. Yeah. okay, you can hear us? Great. Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to uh, show your slides and if you can speak to Okay, I'll share my screen. All right, so if you could go ahead. Thank you very, very much, Elia. And, and sorry, everyone, for the delay previously. There are things you can't really explain. Yeah, but thank you. So hello, everyone. My name is Nigel Dolin, and I'm a research assistant at the Noguchi Memorial Institute for Mem Medical Research in Ghana. I belong to the bioinformatics department where my research is purely focused on computational drug discovery for neglected tropical diseases like bully ulcer and infectious diseases like malaria too. I am entirely grateful for the team at Hand Biotech and whose program and support have been very, very invaluable. And we are almost through with a genomics program and the wealth of knowledge gained from the program is not just meant to be spoken of but to be experienced as well, right? The next slide. So it is in light of this that um, I, together with my team, including Rita James and our PI, Dr. Anita Ganza, I explained a project in malaria. And as the topic says, um, we are looking to elucidate genetic diversity in malaria drug resistance gene, PFCRT, for its impact on drug deployment and to model efficacious drugs. Now, why malaria? 
Malaria is a protozoan parasitic infection transmitted by certain species of anopheline mosquitoes. Four species of plasmodium commonly infect humans, but one, which is the plasmodium falciparum, account for the majority of the instances of morbidity and mortality. And as reported by the World Health Organization, an estimated number of 20, 428 million cases and 405,000 deaths in 2018 alone have been recorded. And children, are, children under the age of five are the ones that are mostly affected by, by this, by malaria. And it would also surprise you to know that Ghana falls among the 15 highest spreading malaria countries. Yes, and that's the country where I am in. The next slide, thank you. Um, to sort of like tell the burden of malaria, there have been drugs that have that have been used, and example of which is chloroquine, sopadoxin, pyrimetamine, and and present current or current frontline um, treatment, which is the artemisinin combination therapy, the or the ACTs. But however, recent mutations have threatened and continue to threaten their efficacy. And of much focus for us right now, it's um, chloroquine, which this which will be the focus of our of our discussion here. And chloroquine, which is the which is a member of the four aminoquinoline, was um, the gold standard for the treatment of uncomplicated malaria for many years. And but is no longer appropriate for the treatment of pl pl plasmodium falciparum malaria in nearly all areas because of drug resistance, which is a major, major issue right now. Yeah. Next slide, please. And so, like I said before, um, atomicinin-based combination therapy, which is the current frontline um, treatment for malaria, um, initially, we've, we've noted or has been recorded that um, there's been treatment failure, which has been linked to ACTs in Southeast Asia, countries like Thailand and Myanmar. And then just in our continent, Africa, there have been early indicators of, of atomicinin resistance, even in Rwanda. And so our focus of the work, therefore, is to, is to constantly track resistance and the transmission in our population. And so that we can also understand the resistance mechanisms and sort of suggest yeah. novel drugs that's good. Hello? And suggest novel drugs that could circumvent the resistance of, of um, malaria caused by plasmodium falciparum. Next slide, please. Right. Um, two genes which have been implicated to um, cause resistance and atomic resistance are the plasmodium falciparum and chloroquine resistance gene, which is the PFCRT, and then the plasmodium falciparum multidrug resistance gene one. Um, PFCRT is on chromosome seven of, of the plasmodium falciparum, and then PFMGR1 is on chromosome five. And they have been indicated to show um, resistance in chloroquine and also atomicinin. And because of our, our presentation, I'll focus on PF, PFCRT to see the common mutations um, which have been listed, mutation at um, position 76, 72, 74, 350, and so on, and um, which then spends the need to further understand the effects of these mutations and continually evolving ones therefore, um, on the structure and function of these genes. And once, once we're able to study the mutations on the structure and function of these genes, it will inevitably help us understand the mechanism of, of resistance and also influence the identification of novel compounds that could circumvent the resistance caused by atomicinin and chloroquine. Um, now, as Mo, I think Mohit has already spoken to this already, so I'll just be brief about this. Now, access of anti malaria drugs into their target, and by target, I mean um, where the drugs um, are, yes, in quote, targeted to, is very important for the action. And so, intracellular targets include um, the digestive vacuum, the cytosol, mitochondria, apicoplast, or the parasite membrane. Intracellular distribution relies mainly on solubility, potential to permeate cell membranes, and the binding affinity to transporters that regulate drug trafficking through intracellular compartments. Now, eukaryotic cells um, evade xenobiotics, and xenobiotics I mean foreign, foreign compounds or, or the drugs by their toxicity, by um, trafficking them into the digestive vacuole. And so this is the digestive vacuole, which is in brown, 
um, no gray, sorry. For further possession or, or they expel them extra, extracellularly, yeah. Now, Plasmodium does this using um, two types of transporters, which I've already mentioned before, which is the P glycoprotein um, later transporters, which um, of course PFMGR1 is included, and the drug metabolite transporter system, which is the PFCRT. Now, um, when we look at the um, the way chloroquine works in terms of um, um, in plasmodium phosphorum, um, chloroquine accumulates in the food vacuum of the parasite, and this accumulation may involve um, ion trapping. Right, and the major action of chloroquine is to inhibit the formation of hemozoin, as already mentioned, from the heme released by the digestion of hemoglobin. Now, the free heme then lyses membranes and leads to parasite death. Now, chloroquine resistance is due to the decreased accumulation of chloroquine in the food vacuum. And as I've mentioned before, PFCRT and PFMDR1 have been implicated in resistance, but they are exact. Um, role, the exact mechanism of action in this regard is not fully known. Right. Next slide, please. So our study focus, therefore, now is to map known um, mutations, like I've, I've mentioned before, the mutations that um, possess same to six, same to two, and so forth. And then unknown mutations, it means that we'll have to um, study the populations and come and see if they are study populations in Ghana and I mean Africa and see if they are actually unknown mutations too. And then we are going to map those mutations to the PFCRT structure, the elucidated function and possible mechanism of action. And then also to identify okay. sorry. Okay. Um, right. hello, so I'll pass it over to Rita. So here, um, my colleague um, Britta would want to continue with this. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Um, good afternoon. My name is Rita Ife Boateng, and I'm currently um, a bioinformatics student at Roots University pursuing PhD. And so I'll be just going through the protocol that we proposed. So basically, our project actually span across everything that we have done and in this um, this study or this uh, um, um, project. Um, so um, spanning across genomics to structure and whatever we are doing now. So for our proposed um, protocol, we aim at identifying some mutations um, through the use of um, looking at mutability, looking at um, multiple sequence alignment and um, other important um, tools that we have learned in this um, course. And then after identifying known and unknown mutation of this gene, we also ask the question that are there structures or protein structures available? Because we actually want to see if we can predict some of the mechanism of resistance um, that this gene um, uses. So if our answer to are these structures available, if it is yes, then now we go into the databases as Dr. Moet have said, to retrieve those, um, um, see this, those structures. However, if our answer is no for structural availability, then we go on to use um, important approach um, which have been widely used in the area of structure, structures and um, availability, which is homology modeling. And our approach is to use the modeler to, to do this. However, we also have an issue with um, protein structures that some of them come with missing residues. So if we identified um, a structure with missing residues, then it is very important for us to model that side. So we also come in a point of also, after retrieving the available structures, checking if there are missing residues and also using the same approach as homology modeling to model those, those approaches. So our question, our next question we asked ourselves after that is that, um, are these mutation, mutations that we have identified important? 
Are they located at um, important domains? Are they located at the active site and other properties? So for that, we will make good use of all the visualization tools which have been mentioned in the in our course using like Chimera, using like um, Pymo to identify if these mutations as we have we identified mapped on the structure actually occurs at functionally important regions. So from there, we will also try and also model the mutated uh, mutant residues that we identified. So from here, we have um, PDB of mutated residue, mutated and um, proteins, and also the wild type. So with this um, um, results, our first thing that we want to ask ourselves is that, is there any effect of mutation on structural flexibility or stability? And for that, we would look at the apple system first. If I'm talking about apple system, I'm talking about a system with no ligand or no a compound. So for that, we have the apple systems, which is the wild type and also the mutants that we will be um, looking at. Our next thing we can also do is to also um, um, do analysis with the um, drug that we are of interest, which is coquine in the presence of coquine. So we want to see if there's some effect on the, um, on the drug um, in respect to this. So from there, our approach is to also do docking. So for us to get a structure with um, croquin in, in, in complex, we need to do docking and we make good use of some of the available tools, which uh, I think Dr. Moet will say more about it, and also make good use of like autodog vinyl and autodog and other tools. So even as um, Dr. Moet has already introduced, so to, in order to, for us to further evaluate our dynamics um, in a mimic cell environment, we would do um, 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 MD simulations, which we will make good use of Gromax and also other important tools for analysis. And um, for our analysis, we would make good use of looking at um, the root mean square deviation, how flexible the residues are, and the compactness of the structure during the dynamics, and hydro bonding, hydrogen bonding formation, and also breakage. So another aspect that we are asking ourselves is that with all this um, mechanism that we are identifying, can it be a basis to um, discovering a new or a novel drug which works better or can work better on this mutated um, genes? So our next question was to do um, a virtual screening of approved drugs and also natural drug databases. Um, in order to identify novel compounds. And for this, our approach will be having all the PDB structures for the muta mutations and also the wild type, which will be like our control. So it will go through the same process, which we will do docking of all these compounds to both the mutant and the wild type. And from there, we will now, um, those compounds that um, actually give us much better energy and also can have an effect on the wild type and also the mutants is what we'll prioritize. And that will subject it into MDs, which we'd want to further evaluate whatever dynamics we are seeing. So it also go through the same approaches, looking at the flexibility of residue, hydrogen bonding interaction um, um, with this novel compounds, which is also very good that we can also come um, um, compare it to the queen and see um, the differences and if we can get another better um, approach or another better compound, which is more than the queen. So from there, I think the baseline of our research is not just to end there, just to identify um, compounds using in silico. But then we also make good use of collaborations to do in vitro assays for further validation of, of our compounds. This has widely been used so the approach of this is very important because um, using this, we'll be able to cut um, off costs and also uh, make good use of our time. So um, we'll make good use of the in vitro assays to further evaluate um, the compounds that we will be identifying. Um, can we please, the next slide. 
So we 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 started something. Um, we started something before um, this presentation. So what we did was that we tried to identify our structures, if indeed our structures are available, because that is the basis of our analysis. So for us, we were fortunate that we got a structure for um, PFCRT. And then when looking, evaluating the structures, we realized that there are some missing residues. And um, please, can you, next slide, please. Thank you. So we realized that there are some missing residues, which you can see over here and also appears in the sequences. So it was very good for us to try and model that side so that we can now subject it into MD. So we try other um, servers and also um, make good use of modular to see if we can model this region. And I think that is what we have here. And then we also try just a primary results to see what, what, what we can do with this data. We also try to identify um, all the known um, mutation, mutation that has been known to cause resistance and also map them to structure. And as you can see the structure here, these are the mutations that are known to cause um, resistance. And if you look at down here, sorry, it's not visible, but this domain down here, is very important for um, um, the parasite. So this actually is um, 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 a foundation for whatever, what we want to do. And I think this uh, section will give us more insight into all that we want to do. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Rita and Nigel. Mohita, I think we can pass it back to you. Yeah, thank you, Ria, and thank you, Nigel. And uh... hello, can you hear me? Hello, hello. Yes, yes we can hear. Okay. Yeah, let, let me share my screen again. Uh, one second. So uh, uh, the structural characterization, and thank you for giving us the overview. So now we can talk more about maybe the structural analysis that we could do on top of the information that we have already. So to, learn, to talk about the structural analysis and what all one can do once one has the model. So before having a model, uh, uh, you you may have the sequence, right? So you start from a sequence, and from the sequence you start uh, looking at uh, what are what are the available structures for that sequence? Does uh, are there or not? So when you are looking at the available structures, uh, you are searching through the Blast uh, P uh, program. So there is in Blast. So maybe I can show you all. So when I go to BLAST P, uh, the, which is the protein sequence BLAST. So when you have a, a sequence and you don't know whether there are any structures available for the sequence or not. So maybe you can start from this place, uh, very basic. So here you have to paste uh, the sequence of your interest, the sequence that you want to model the protein of, uh, and then here you change it to protein data then. So once you do that, you do the blast then, it's pretty simple, place the sequence here, and then change the data set here, database here, and then do blast. So once you do that, uh, the sequence that of that is of your interest uh, will uh, search against the protein data wing. So there you will find the closest homologs that are out there. Another option, uh, another few options are there for modeling. Uh, and uh, I would want to tell you all about that, those. So Swiss model. So Swiss model uh, is again another web server where you can model your proteins. And also there is a docking uh, platform available, Swiss doc. So here you have to paste your sequence and then you have to name the title and then you put your project and then you can search for templates, which means that 
what are the closest uh, templates available for you to model so templates are those which are uh, uh, which are aligned with your sequence though templates are those that are the closest uh, sequence uh, aligned to your sequence of interest so this is again maybe i also have like maybe a login here so if i log in i can show you the analysis and maybe one case study so what we are looking at is pfcrt and today i showed you that uh, so i have the pfcrt so today I showed you that uh, that uh, the model for PSCRT uh, could be built through these many uh, different templates. So we have the cryo EM structure, and then we have different structures that are uh, that shows uh, lower homology, but are uh, transporter structures. Uh, so sometimes this information might not be enough. So one of the disadvantages uh, from a structural biology perspective is uh, for using a cryo structure is that, as uh, Rita, Rita uh, rightly said, that many parts are missing. So some of the side chain information, which is very important to learn when you're looking at mutations, especially. So when you're looking at mutations, you're expecting the side chains because the backbone is going to be the same. And then the side chains that vary from amino acid to amino acid have to be you know traced so one of the problems with a, a higher resolution or a, sorry lower resolution structure or uh, maybe cryo em structure is that that you don't get that, that much amount of resolution so maybe if there is a crystal structure that would give you a better uh, understanding so here you will see that template so all the templates that are out there that it found so this uh, this um, server uses uh, HHP bits, uh, which is a which is an algorithm to do this. So you can use that separately as well, and then it gives you different kind of scoring to choose the template. So you can choose here what kind of uh, based on the score and based on the based on the different scales. So sometimes when you are modeling, and this is very important. So once you are modeling, uh, in uh, then basically what we do is that we model one uh, chain. So one chain is what uh, is a monomer. So proteins can uh, uh, can be present in different uh, multimeric states. So they can be monomer, they can be dimer, they can be trimer, they can be hexamer or maybe multimers. So this oligo state uh, and uh, this the modeling of our oligo state is important in those uh, examples when the protein is functional in a trimeric or a monomeric or a dimeric state, uh, not in monomeric, but dimeric or higher merged uh, where the, the, they are there. So in this model, this option is there to do this, but otherwise you can do it uh, in using the crystal structure. So we will just quickly go also back to the uh, protein data bank. So before we go into the protein data bank, let's click here and see this, what residue is this, and maybe we can go from here as well. So structure and drug resistance of plasmodium falciparum transporter PSCRT this published in Nature and this is a chloroquine resistant transporter with uh, B and C chains and this is uh, from PDB and here you have the structure so you can visualize the structure in three dimensions and there is something bound here as well if you can see that I'll zoom in. So what is the ligand here you can see the ligand so you have a ligand here already and you have an active site that you can target so this is uh, cholesterol that is bound here and plip is a interfor plip interaction so you can see the interaction what kind of interaction it is making so there are hydrophobic interactions and there is also a salt bridge that is forming between the the residue of the protein and the uh, ligand so this sort of information you can write, see right here and this is about the template so the template is the crystal uh, or the cryo structure which is the experimental structure 
so here uh, learning about the experiment structure more you can simply search this if you search 6qkj the first link that is going to come up is the rcsb so the rcsb is a protein data bank where all the protein structures are uh, deposited that are experimentally derived so here you will find this entry and you can totally download this file from here you can also download just the sequence file and you can also download structure three dimensional file that you were just seeing uh, by uh, by using these uh, many so here it is classified as a membrane protein organism expression vec vector about the experiment that was done to express this protein and uh, and then the technique here you will see here you will see the molecular weight and how many atoms are there how many residues are there here model means that it's a it's a modeling through uh, software which is uh, to model the residues within the electro electromagnetic uh, sorry uh, the the nesh of uh, electrons that we get from the experiment so this is not like uh, the modeling that we are doing so anyways uh, we have here different uh, types of tabs that you can go and look into and a lot of information you will find here and uh, as i was telling you about the biological assembly asymmetric unit is in the crystal structure you can read about the paper that that got uh, published along with this uh, this structure which kind of uh, 100% describes the structure in much more depth uh so this is this is uh, something that you should do so other than that this information you can get the uh, protein structure here as well as the ligand uh, residue you can uh, you can use that ligand for another other studies as well so this is the protein data bank and you're free feel free to uh, you know kind of explore this and also you can search by name of proteins by name of uh, whatever you have in your mind about a structural uh, aspect of a gene so here you can search and uh, do that so going back to the template uh, here what we have seen in model is uh, we have seen the templates now we will see the model and as rita was telling you that we will be using modeler and so there another uh, way to use modeler is mod uh, mod web which is the which is the uh, which is the server version of the of the tool so here in the server version again you can just put the sequence here and then uh, you can name email address and this key uh, if you have academic address uh, academic email address you will get this key and that you will also be requiring to do the modeler so here uh, in sali's lab you will find different other tools also that are helpful to understand different aspects of uh, uh, structure structural biology or uh, so it's a good lab and they have generated a lot of uh, great uh, uh, tools so this is modeler uh, so in ucsf you will also have ucsf chimera which will be used for visualization so as we are running out of time i will just uh, now focus on maybe the structural analysis a little bit so let's uh, go back uh, to that and let's open this structures so before we do that i just wanted to tell you uh, in quick uh, slides that uh, how the structure is being modeled so when you model a structure then you can do what you can do structural comparison so when you do structural comparison which is uh, superimposition so what we do is that you align your 3d structure into another 3d structure like you might have heard about sequence alignment where you use cluster w or you use multiple sequence alignment tools to uh, you know align two sequences similarly you can align structures as well so that there are different algorithms that are being used for this so not going into those details right now but to tell you more about that when you align structures then you get the result of alignment as you know the difference between the results in alignment as uh, rms d uh, root mean square deviation so here you can see rms d so this root mean square deviation means how those two structures differ differ from each other and this uh, this value is usually denoted in um, angstrom it's a very small scale so it's uh, uh, 1 to the power minus 10 so you are looking at very smaller state of molecules these small molecules and then 
you are looking at these variations as well between two molecules uh, in angstrom so these are values in angstrom and they tell you about that that once you have a structure and then you want to see whether how close this structure is with another structure that's quite possible so you can do this in pymol you can do this in uh, chimera uh, there is a matchmaker tool that is there in chimera which you can use and then uh, once you have the model so here on the right panel uh, you can see that there are some plots and uh, start uh, graph are, graphs are there so while modeling uh, what we consider is that we consider some of uh, the matrices that are that defines the quality so those matrices are important to evaluate so uh, for membrane protein there is like this upper plot has q mean uh, membrane analysis uh, so pseudo energy is also being calculated for the transmembrane uh, structures and then the graph shows the per residue local quality so these are the things that you might want to consider when you're looking at the model and then one of the biggest takeaway point that i would want to tell you that is that once you derive a model once you obtain a model from the um, from the tool like modeler sys model or something like that then the next step would be the better step would be to do a energy minimization which can be uh, through uh, molecular dynamic simulation so the energy minimization algorithm what it does is that it minimizes the overall energy of the molecule to a global uh, local uh, lower state and that global local state at lower at lower energy these molecules are more stable and that uh, actually kind of resembles what is there inside uh, the organism so it kind of resembles more closer to the real uh, real protein structure so however i mean uh, to there are different scores that you can calculate uh, through ramachandran plot so here you can see the psi and phi angles that are plotted in this graph and that tells you about the outliers that tells you about the quality of the models that how the side chains are uh, modeled uh, how good they have been modeled so in this uh, binding site you have 10 transmembrane uh, transporter uh, helices so the overall structure you can see this uh, cartoon and the um, the face which is towards uh, uh, so vascular face uh, and then then these are the uh, then you can see these pdb id identifiers so these are the structural uh, identifiers and you can go into those sites and look into those as well now uh, when modeling the pfcrt and you just saw that uh, uh, the trita showed uh, the uh, the sites uh, the binding and the uh, and the structures that we have created with modeler so uh, going into the experiment i mean it's important to understand so what pdb is what you did you look at looked at you looked at a protein uh, pdb uh, pdb uh, database and then you looked into the structures so what are what are these structures so let me now maybe show you that in three dimension so i'll stop sharing from this account and i'll move to some, uh, another account for sharing uh, that so let me try from there so uh, elia can you make my other account uh, also so it's dr mohit mazumdar can you make that uh, co host as well it's goes down to thank you elia so now let me share the screen so what we are trying to do now is to we are trying to visualize these proteins uh, by their structures so what we are going to do is will open the protein data bank using pymol so if you guys know pymol uh, then it's great if you don't then it's okay i will tell you in very um, um, in concise but um, we can do that later as well so we have some tutorials that we can forward to you to learn about this uh, structural visualization tool called pymol and also chimera and you can do it by yourself also this is very popular tool so what we are looking at here is the 
um, is the cryo em structure which uh, also uh, showed by rita and then maybe we can also look at the model structure so here we have the model structures right so what we can see here is the uh, all the residues right so here in the s if i put the s button we'll see the sequence so you can see the entire sequence here and you can identify the residues that cause like that some mutation that uh, uh, that is there so this mutation uh, k to t now let's look at with uh, look at uh, with the help of uh, other visualization way so i'll hide every hide everything and then show cartoon so we have this now cartoon view now you can see this into like uh, the way it is folded in helices and loops and then uh, we have different settings that we can use to see uh, the these helices into uh, maybe a cylindrical form so now we have a cylindrical helices now what we want to see is those active sites and what we can do is that because it's a model and we don't have the crystal structure so we also have the crystal structure uh, sorry the cry am structure so now we have loaded two molecules in one so you can see in one uh, in one we have two molecules so how you can compare these two molecules because they are apart right in the three dimensional space they are away from each other so what we do is that we align so what we will do is that we will align there is like easy way to do this like you can align like this so now they are aligned so you can see that So this is a full structure and everything show cartoon. Now you can see that these two have aligned and there is this additional domain um, that is there present in, uh, in the PFCRT and these are the transmembrane helices. So now you have aligned. Now, as I was telling you that you can know about the RMSC. So there is this, uh, there are two panels that open when you open bimol so this second panel uh, if i show you the log here will show you the rmsd so this rmsd is 2.369 angstrom right so that's how you can uh, compare two structures in bimol and similarly it's very simple to do in uh, chimera as well so now i mean we would want to do some structural analysis so one has the ligand another one does not have the ligand so it also has the other chain so maybe we can also see this by display by chain identifier so we have chain a chain h chain h is this side and then chain l so these two molecules h and l so we if we hide no wait we also have the ligand so we were finding the ligand excuse me Where one doubt ligand? one yeah. one doubt uh, will you please tell me again how you have brought two structures uh, in one one screen i just missed it so let me redo it from the beginning i'll just close this so i have downloaded the structure so let me again do that also so I will show you from the beginning so that there is no confusion. I'm sorry. So 6K, I searched this, right? And then I got to here. And by the way, I have the models, okay, uh, downloaded and created. So that was before. So I just downloaded this one. So you, you have one so point. That, that part is download. clear. That part yeah, is clear. Yeah means we do have some uh, two structures we are opening it together but only how you have opened it we just missed it 
so i just uh, did like this i opened it here uh, now this again panel i opened another one and you can like uh, that way open several structures so you can open 100 structures at one time and do the analysis so now going back to the uh, problem at hand so we have this structure loaded now i have also the models that we have created so this is another model that uh, is there and i want to put in this model uh, where the active site is so how do we know in the model where the active site is for our docking study uh, because uh, we are going to use the model right so now uh, we will look at the sequence so we looked at the sequence and this is where the molecule is okay now we have to do the alignment right to see how they are uh, aligned to molecule pfcrt now they are together right now we'll remove this because that shows the residues and now this is the molecule now what i did before uh, last open time two molecules at a time it will be in two different windows right no Normally. i mean we opened it we opened it one window why would it be in two windows we have it in one place in one 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 place so here it's going to populate in this panel if you see now you have two structures you can visualize one at a time or you can visualize select one or select none so here i can load more and more structure uh, so it does not matter uh, you are just opening it again yeah i'm loading other structures into the same panel and here we have multiple structures that we want to visualize anyways going back to the study and we are running out of time I'm sorry we can maybe figure this out later uh, because it's a personal problem i guess so this is, uh, these are opened in one window and in one window you have a panel here on the right where you can load multiple structures and then you can analyze multiple structures. So it's kind of pretty simple. So uh, now maybe we can show you again after the session or maybe sometime else. Please reach out to us about that. So uh, I will hide everything and I will show you the cartoon. And then what I was trying to do is that I wanted to see the uh, just the ligand, right? So now the ligand is here, Y01. Now uh, the ligand cannot be in in this uh, in this form because it's a uh, it's a small molecule and it does not it cannot attain like a 3D structure like this, but it can be seen as sticks or lines. So we'll do sticks and then we will color it by uh, this sort of coloring scheme where you can see that the oxygen molecules and the carbon molecules also. So here uh, we have the crystal structure, uh, sorry, the atom, uh, so the ligand, and we also have the two other molecules. Now, what we are trying to do is that, what we are trying to build a complex of drug and the, uh, uh, maybe the drug binding site or whatever with the receptor. So what we are going to do is uh, that we are just going to uh, select this and we are going to copy this, copy this object. Now this is an additional copy that has been created. Now I'll remove this. Now we have these two molecules together. Now this is our model and this is the site. And now I can also look into the interaction here. So this is uh, a co-complex co co model that you got just by superimposing without docking. So here, uh, what we will do similarly, we have found the site and now we will have to uh, uh, go to auto dock and then define this site and then we will do the simulation. But I think uh, that maybe we can cover in the next session. Uh, it's more about preparing the system to, be, be, to, to become more ready for the simulation. And now we will also look at the mutation. So we will, let's look at the mutation. So mutation was at the 76th position. So here at the 76th position, I have highlighted. And then when you click here, and you can see that it gets selected. When I click here, it gets selected. So when it gets selected, you can go to the select part because this is what it selected. Object one is the ligand, and these are the different 
the different uh, molecules that I've loaded. So three structures I've loaded, and I was just doing analysis with one structure. What I did was I took uh, the the uh, experimental structure and I extracted the ligand from the experimental structure and put it in, put it together, and then I wanted to put it together with the model. That's uh, that's simply what I'm trying to do. And also now I wanted to look at the mutation. So how this mutation is going to influence the structure. So this is the mutation right here. Uh, so I will show it in stick. Show in stick. So now it is seen in stick. I can also change the color to any color I like. So maybe be pink uh, because it's bright. Okay, got it. So now we have the mutation, and you can see this this binding site is away from this this cavity. So this is a different cavity where uh, the transport is happening, which is the chloroquinin binding site. So uh, maybe that's the hypothesis. Now we want to validate it further, and uh, we want to do the mutation. So we want to do change uh, the, this residue to thiamine, so K to T. So how do we do that? Uh, three only, sorry. Yeah, how do we do that? So we can do that using uh, pymol only. Uh, so here we will go to do wizards and we will do mutagenesis. So here in mutagenesis, uh, this panel comes in on the right, no mutation, to mutation. So we will do mutation. We'll change it to threonine. And uh, this is the one I guess selected, and then I'll apply. Okay, I have to select the residue. Yeah, now it is uh, selected, it has selected the residue, and now it is showing the probability. So here you will also see some inference. So this is actually showing you the probability of this mutation. Here you will see the probability in uh, in uh, digits, 15.8% probability uh, for this mutation to be like this. So uh, I will do apply, so it will change the structure. So I'll do apply. Now it's T. So your K has changed to T. So this is a mutant structure, but how stable it is, uh, is something that we don't know. And that's why I was telling you that the next step after this is molecular dynamic simulation. So uh, now uh, we have the structure and we can totally save all of it. Now I tell you how, how do you do that? So you can do that by selecting it. So I'll select this entire structure by just, uh, you know, putting my mouse around it. So it's got selected. And also I can do this uh, without doing this manually, but I'm just showing you. Uh, you can do this by selecting the entire chain rather than selecting each and every residue. But I've selected all the residues. So they got, they are in this selection uh, you know, menu. And then I selected the this uh, um, ligand also, just in case I need a ligand uh, complex. So the preferred one would be here also. So we would get it by docking and then uh, we would be doing this maybe in the next session. So now uh, we have all the selection. I will go to file and then I'll save molecule. And then I'll here select uh, the C S E L E select. And now I'll press okay. Now this is our, my molecule, which is, uh, which has the mutation mutant, uh, K76 to T, I'm sorry. Huh. So it's mutant K76 to T, now it's saved. Now my molecule is being saved uh, like this into one complex structure now, which I can use for another study other studies. So this is some uh, manipulation that you can do. And there are so many other things that also you can do. You can, you should start exploring and then uh, you should let us know about uh, doing this. How do you do this uh, more? And how do you do this in the context of a project? 
so how we are in this uh, in this uh, program uh, we are working on the different aspects of connecting this data from uh, population studies then tracing it back to the mutation and then doing the structural analysis and devising strategies so in today's session as we have had a lot of things covered i think maybe we can uh, shift the next uh, to the next session where we describe into the next step but today what i wanted to tell you about that to prepare a system and be, uh, make it available for your analysis is very critical and very important the more accurately we do it the better results you will get and this is based on my experience because the mutations that we have designed for the experiments and then validating in, in them into a lab, into the lab that costs a lot so here you are doing a lot of you know uh, in, investing a lot of uh, funds to validate that so it's great when you have the right kind of results and then with that information you you're supposed to get good results as well so that is about the structural analysis today now i'd like to pass it on uh, maybe bisha uh, to talk about the research fellowship and the project so yeah. uh, I, i don't know i don't know if bipsa uh, is here um but uh maybe since we don't have a lot of time we can summarize this by speaking briefly about you know what have we planned for taking these projects further so as you can see from all of these uh studies that have been shared today the process from getting a project idea to uh getting it completed is not trivial Uh, you have to have the capability to collect data, process the data, interpret what you have found, and make sure that it was done correctly. Up until the moment that you can actually start thinking about, you know, going into an independent uh, direction. So, what we have been thinking about a lot in our um, uh, experience uh, was getting you the right kinds of resources that address all of these uh, issues that were discussed. So let me briefly kind of tell you about these resources so those of you that are not a part of a program yet can start thinking about how to do that. And the first thing that I want to introduce you to is the Learn Omics Logic uh, portal where all of these things are kind of listed out. So Uh, our focus is on providing assistance uh, on uh, biology as a data science, helping you acquire the skills, understanding the application of these skills to specific projects and types of data, and then uh, letting you leverage this big data infrastructure to develop and uh, conduct independent research. And so the logic of this program is to start with some small achievable goals to get training in these different methods of analysis then to perform uh, replicate uh, studies that have been done by researchers that know what they're doing they're experts in what they are doing um, and then once you understand the methodology you can either decide to do this technically yourself and do some coding and kind of understand r and python or you can uh, just kind of replicate the logic using some of these analysis tools that we have done now Today we've talked a lot about malaria and uh we have similar resources that are dedicated to oncology, neuroscience and agriculture where you can explore a variety of projects, courses and tracks that explain similar topics and uh, application. Um in each one of these we we've provided some basic tools that you can leverage for sequence alignment, measure uh, and understanding of RNA seq uh, experiments. uh learn about evolution um and then uh, also some tools for machine learning and variant calling as well as structure analysis um and of course we have some tutorials on how to do certain things in R and Python and what's important is that you can start with this program for free so um if you're on the site um you can register uh, for free and then gain access to a lot of these tools Now two specific programs that I want to mention that are coming up. One is we have learned today about uh methods of uh simulation docking and kind of translating these variants to the structural realm to understand what is really happening happening with these structures. 
but we will also explore analysis of RNA-seq data, which are going to be useful to see what are some of the translation uh, issues that come out as we study mRNA transcription. So how does RNA transcribed from DNA, how to measure gene expression levels, and also how to understand alternative splicing in the context of bulk and single cell RNA-seq. So there we will have a full training program. It starts April 16th, which is tomorrow. So all of you are welcome to join our free session, the first session that we will have for this program. And uh, finally, I want to also mention uh, a program called um, drug discovery. For those of you that are interested in the intersection between analysis of molecular structures, molecular dynamics, docking, as well as data science and how these skills are used in the industry. We have this exciting program that will be led by um, Pine Biotech trainers, including Mohit, um, as well as uh, some industry experts from um, other uh, companies. Uh, so we do um, welcome all of you to explore this program. It is structured over the course of several months because you can actually uh, focus on either chemoinformatics and artificial intelligence and drug design, or you can join uh, sessions about machine learning, uh, or you can learn about different types of omics data. Um, and essentially design a project that maybe leverages either one or multiple aspects of these types of analyses. So uh, if you have any questions specifically about this program, I do recommend reaching out to Mohit. Uh, Mohit's email uh, is Mohit at Pine Bio. He has been uh, designing this program together with his collaborators at Pharma Toppers and Faba Academy. So um, this is a program for those of you that enjoyed the session today and what Mohit was talking about, and you can learn a lot from him and experts like him in this upcoming program. Finally, uh, we do have a research fellowship that I want to invite you uh, to explore. The research fellowship is a program for those of you that do not really want to get a training program, but just want to focus on doing your own research. Um, so, uh, sorry, Nupur, I gave the link to that uh, drug discovery program. Please take a look there, and Mohit, maybe you can answer in the chat about the program start and all of those details. So concerning, um, thank you. So concerning the research fellowship, uh, the research fellowship is a program to focus on independent research. And uh, today what you have seen, the presentation by Nigel and uh, um, Rita, was kind of a view of what you would do in this program. So instead of learning about the different tools, you would actually have uh, the mentorship and the guidance to kind of focus on a research problem that you can solve using various tools uh, that are either available on our platforms or that you might want to find that are more applicable to your problem at hand. But you will have access to experts like Mohit, uh, like Harpreet, who was here today, uh, Clinton and others that could help support your uh, technical um, the side of the problem and also guide you. And then at the end, you will have access to some expert feedback. Um, and that expert feedback comes from our collaborators at uh, the Tower Bioinformatics Research Center at University of Haifa. So here you can see a few examples of projects that were done by some of the people that have completed the research fellowship. Uh, we also have uh, um, some feedback uh, right here from people that have uh, completed and also uh, there is some description about some of the tools and access to a variety of things that you would gain access to uh, in this program. So if this is interesting to you, I recommend reaching out so you can either uh, learn more uh, right here. You can get started. I think there's an option for three and six months. Um, and also we have regular webinars. Uh, and thank you, Mohit. There is a, also a pre-registration page where you can learn a lot more about this uh, Omics Logic Biomedical Drug Discovery Program. 
So if you do have any questions, thank you, Mohit, for pasting this link. Uh, there's a, an email for Beepsa Biswas. She is going to be helping you decide which program is right for you, how to get registered, and how to get all the details. It's marketing at pine.bio. So thank you, everyone, for joining today. Uh, hopefully, you enjoyed this session. Uh, thank you, Rita and Nigel, for presenting your research project. Uh, thank you, Mohit and Harpreet, for uh, sharing from your background, and also Mohit for the wonderful session on the hands-on uh, molecular dynamics and uh, um, all of that. And hopefully, you will enjoy this webinar enough to join our upcoming free webinars that we will have, and we will post them on our social media. So we do ask that you uh, join our LinkedIn group um, if you enjoy these kinds of topics. Uh, we have a group on LinkedIn called Omics Logic. Uh, if you want to interact with professionals and experts in this field and uh, kind of see some job and internship opportunities, that would be the place to go. We also have a group on Facebook uh, where you can join uh, by answering just a few questions about yourself and here you will also see uh, this webinar that is going on. So you, you can see a lot of the different things that we do. We post those videos right here. All right, so um, Mohit, did you wanna add anything uh, to this? I know, yeah, thank you everyone. I just wanted to thank everyone. All right, great. So thanks for joining and we will see you again next time. Thank you, everyone.